Hey everybody, over the past few months I've been testing out the new Ascar V telescope and today I want to give you my feedback and let you know if this is worth the investment or not. I should also mention that Ascar sent this out to me back in May. They said if I like it, I can buy it. If I don't like it, I can always send it back. So that's how I get the telescope early. And without further ado, let's just get right into it. I've got the Ascar V right here. Comes in this nice carrying case. It's pretty lightweight and portable. So if you do need to travel for your shooting situation, I think this is gonna be a great choice. Now there's quite a bit different with this telescope than something like my Red Cat, for example. The way this works is that the Ascar V is an entire system and a modular system at that built into this one case. You've got an 80 millimeter optic and a 60 millimeter optic. That's the aperture, not the focal length. And you can either choose one or the other. Then from there, you can choose one of three adapters. There's an extender, a flattener, and a reducer. And if you're like me and you don't really understand what those are just yet, I'll explain it here in a few minutes. But that's the basics of the setup. Let's take a look and see what we're working with. And there we go. We've got the main telescope right here. This is the 80 millimeter configuration that it comes with automatically. But like I said, at any time, you can actually unscrew the whole end piece here, take the 60 and screw that in. The reason you want to do this is maybe you want something lighter, more portable, or just a wider field of view. But those are really your two choices right there. Now, once you've chosen between the 80 and the 60, Again, you can go with one of the three adapters. We've got the reducer, which will basically reduce your focal length, give you a wider field of view, but let in more light to your camera. Then we've got the flattener. This is kind of the boring option. It doesn't really do much at all. It just helps to correct your stars, and uh, that's really all there is to it. So the flattener, that's kind of your default setting. We also have an extender. If you want to get more zoom, but less light. So maybe if you want to photograph the moon, this might be a nice choice. Now between these three options here and your 80 millimeter and 60 millimeter, you essentially have six different telescopes in this one package. And for that reason, I think this can be a great idea if you're looking to get your very first telescope, or in my case, your second telescope, and you want a lot of flexibility. One thing to understand though, is that let's say you're gonna swap out for the 60, then you need to make the corresponding change on your adapters. It's actually very easy to do. I was worried at first that this would be complicated, but it's very simple. So if you look closely here, you can see there's an 80 marking. That's the default. But at any time, you just unscrew it. And there's gonna be a hard stop here, so you don't have to worry about going too far and far enough. And now you'll see it says 60. Then I can install this in the back of the telescope, attach my camera, and then I'm up and running. So that's how you swap between the 80 and 60 for all three of your adapters, depending on what you want to do. I should also mention that at the back here, there's a filter thread. So if you're shooting with a color camera and you want to do narrowband, you can install your two inch filter right here and you're all set. The only problem with this idea is you just have to remember to switch it back. You know, if you're going back to 80, don't forget to put it back to 80. Now, one of my initial concerns with this system is that if you're going to be swapping between all these different components, you're probably gonna get a lot of dust, right? But funny enough, they actually include a little rocket blower to take care of that problem. And realistically, I don't think dust is gonna be that big of a concern. The reason I say that is because when I was using this system, I stuck with the 80 millimeter and the reducer for most of the testing. And my thought process was, I want around 400 millimeters and I want a lot of light coming into the camera because I don't have that much darkness every night. And that setup worked fine. So I had no need to swap back and forth between the 60 and the 80 or the extender and the flattener. I just stuck with one thing for multiple nights and that's gonna help to cut down on any theoretical dust that might enter the system. Another concern I had was just that all these threads are gonna get complicated and I'm gonna get confused. There's just so much going on here. But again, after you spend even 10 minutes with the system, you'll really get a hang of it very quickly. And if I could figure this out, I'm sure you'll be just fine. Now, with all that out of the way, let's take a look at the focuser because this was a welcome change. You know, with my Red Cat, it's got a focuser kind of like a telephoto lens, but with this one here, you've got a fast focuser, but also a more smooth, precise focuser. And these all correspond with some numbers printed right on the tube. Now, this can be very helpful because 
let's say you get your everything dialed in here and you know that your focus needs to be a little bit over two, you can put it right there to start on the next night and know that your focus is gonna be pretty darn close. So in terms of the focusing, this is a nice treat. The focuser, I have no complaints with that. The only issue I had is I actually did not have a Batnov mask for this telescope. And when I thought about it, I'm like, well, wait a minute. My Red Cat comes with the Batnov mask built into the lens hood, which is one of my favorite things about it. So I emailed Askar and I said, hey, why don't you guys do something similar? It's a really good idea. And that's when they told me that the idea was actually patented by William Optics, which means nobody else can do anything similar, which kind of sucks. And therefore, what I had to do is buy some cheap plastic uh, Batnov mask off of Amazon for like $15. It showed up, the screws didn't even fit in the holes. That was not fun, and it barely stayed on the front of here. But then, uh, just a couple days ago, I saw that Ascar had released a 3D printed Batnov mask. Actually, we've got two of them back here. And you can get them for 20 bucks. So there's an 80 millimeter and the 60. They both come in the same package. Obviously, it just depends on which optic you're gonna use. So then what you can do, if I take off the front here, you can just take your Batnov mask, put it right on the front, and you're good to go. The only problem is that if you're horizontal or even just slightly down, it's gonna fall off. So it would have been nice if they included some way to have a bit more of a secure, snug fit, that way it doesn't fall off. But uh, beyond that, that's really my only complaint. So what I would say is that if you are gonna be using this system, definitely get the $20 3D printed Batnov masks from Ascar. It's gonna be worth the money. And it will really help with your focusing at night, which is obviously very important. Let's talk about build quality next because there were two problems that stuck out to me. I mean, overall, it's a good design. Uh, everything seems to be pretty well built. I haven't had any serious problems, but one thing I did notice is that on the extender, there is a pretty big nick cut out of the threads. It looks like, I don't know what happened, but something happened anyway. And like I said, I saw this as soon as I opened it up out of the case, which makes me wonder why quality control didn't catch this. Maybe they didn't think, didn't think it was that big of a deal, but either way, that was a bit concerning. So I emailed Ascar and their response was essentially, don't worry about it. I mean, if you screw it in and you notice problems, let us know, but otherwise it should be fine. That wasn't exactly the answer I wanted to hear, to be honest, but I installed it, didn't hear any grinding noises. It seems to just screw in fine. So I think it's okay, but still it would have been nice to have that issue resolved a bit better as it is, I don't think it's a problem, but you never know. So that was the first problem I had. The other problem I had was actually recording this video. I went to pick this up, and in one of the takes, the whole thing came apart, which was very scary. What happened, I think, is that this bracket here is attached at this hinge line. And I noticed that there was like a little silver, I don't know what you'd call it, a little silver rod or something. And it had fallen out of something. I wasn't sure where it came from. Well, after further investigation, I think what happened is that there was two silver rods that should have been here to hold this all together, and they had both fallen out, so the whole thing came apart. And what I had to do was really wedge them in there, and now it's back to being sturdy and secure. So on the off chance you notice two or one little tiny silver rod in your case, that's where it's supposed to go, and you might need to force it back in there to prevent everything from coming apart. But that could have been very disastrous. You know, imagine I'm taking this out, in the back country or something, the whole thing crashes to the ground and breaks. That's another quality control concern I do have. Again, they're both very minor in the grand scheme of things, but uh, you know, minor could become major very quickly if you're not careful. So I just thought I'd mention that. But in terms of the build quality, overall, it's pretty darn good. I don't have many complaints other than those few minor issues. The next thing I wanna do is just show you how to actually set all this up, because I know if I was looking to buy this system, I'd be very confused and a little bit overwhelmed. So what I wanna do is show you how to attach your camera to either the reducer, the flattener, the extender, with the understanding that it's all basically the same thing. I'll also show you to attach the 60 millimeter option if that's what you wanna do. And then once we've done that, we'll move on and talk about the vignette performance. The first thing you'll need to do is remove this back piece right here. And there's a lot of different threads here, so you have to make sure you start unscrewing it at the right spot. If you watch the video though, you'll see what I mean. Once this back piece is removed, then we can go through and choose one of the three adapters, either the extender, the reducer, or the flattener. 
Once you've chosen your adapter, you can screw it right into the back of the telescope and it should go in without a problem. For those that are using a color camera, now would be the time to unscrew the very back thread here, grab your narrowband filter if you have one, and screw it right in. Once your filter is installed, you can reattach the rear element here and then move on. And for those with monochrome cameras or if you don't have a filter, don't worry about this step. Finally, remove the rear cap and now we can attach our camera to the ASCAR V. And I found this is a lot easier if you mount everything vertically. It just makes the threads go together a lot easier. And for those that are wondering, this is the same back focus as pretty much any other telescope. So you shouldn't have to do anything different from your current setup. I just screw in my adapters here and then we're all set. And that's all there is to it. You saw just how easy it is to configure your camera on the ASCAR. However, if you want to use the 60 millimeter option, then you'll want to unscrew the 80 millimeter lens and then screw in the 60 millimeter. When you do this though, you have to remember to change your adapters as well. So if we grab one of the adapters from our kit, we can see it's currently at 80. So we'll start unscrewing it and then eventually it will go up to 60. And one of the weird things is that you're actually gonna have to pull the black piece upwards a lot of the time. That way it, it's kind of like a bellows almost. So pull it up, turn it until it locks in at the 60 line. Now you're ready to attach it back to the telescope and move on from there. And if you forget to do this step, it's not the end of the world. It's not gonna break anything, but you might get some weird aberrations and things in your photos. So you wanna make sure you don't forget that one step. And just like before, if you had a filter, you can also install that in the back. But as you're starting to see, the setup process for the ASCAR is not nearly as complicated as it might seem. Next up, I wanna show you some photos I took with the ASCAR V. And this is my first finished photo of the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. And even though it's only three nights worth of data, one for each filter, I think it still turned out pretty nice. Now that you've seen the final image, let's head over into PixInsight and take a look at the raw photos to give you some idea of how this is gonna look. Here on the left, I have the H-alpha, and on the right, I have the sulfur. And if I zoom in here, you can see that the stars are nice and sharp. Of course, we can't see much beyond that, so let's hit Controller Command A to stretch the data. We'll do the same thing for the H-alpha image. And we take a step back. Again, this is only a single photo. There's definitely some nice detail in the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. And if we look at the corners of the photo, I mean, to be clear, this is taken with a one inch sensor, so we're still cropped into the very center of the telescope. As I might have mentioned, I will be doing more tests on the star performance with a full frame camera later on this year. But at this very narrow crop with a one inch sensor, the stars look fine from corner to corner, as we would all expect. Next, let's load up some of the stacked files and then we'll go from there. And here we have the stacked photos. Again, this really isn't that much data. During the summer, we only had about an hour to two hours at the most of darkness per night. And then from there, we only had about three clear nights. So not that much data, but it still turned out pretty nice. I don't think I mentioned this yet, but these photos were all taken with the 80 millimeter optic and the reducer, which gave me about 384 millimeters. And I don't remember off the top of my hand what the aperture was, probably around f4.5 if I'm not mistaken. The point I'm trying to make is that even though I didn't have the fastest telescope in the world, it still turned out really nice and clean, considering this was only about one night's worth of data and a short night at that. Then here on the right, we have the stacked oxygen data. This one looks noticeably worse, and that's just due to my own laziness. One of the things I always stress is that when you're taking photos at night, you need to double check that they stay sharp, because as your telescope cools in the night air, it will shift the focus. And on this night, I just kind of forgot about it, didn't check it, so the stars were blurry. But if you remember back to the final image, it still looked pretty good. So that's thanks mainly to Blur Exterminator. And if you don't have Blur Exterminator yet, I highly recommend checking that out. It really is a lifesaver. And then finally, we have the sulfur data right here. Pretty grainy, as one would expect with only a few hours worth of data. But still, with the help of Noise Exterminator, that also helps to clear up those problems. Finally, we have the color image right here. This is in the Hubble color palette. And I think I got some nice color separation, especially up here on the left. We go from the blues to the yellows to the greens, as well as the oranges over here. And if you wanna learn how to process this photo, check out my Deep Space course over on HowTube. I've actually turned this into a full tutorial so you can learn exactly what I did. 
And while the image does look pretty nice, all things considered, I would still like to get more data because the more data I get, the more detail and the sharper overall I can get the photo. Before we move on to the vignette tests, let's take a look at another photo I captured. This is the Iris Nebula. And I'm still not done editing this one. I need a lot more exposure time because if you look here, it just still needs a lot of work. There's a green gradient, but the nebula itself looks pretty cool. And one of the nice things about the Iris Nebula is it's pretty much up all year long. So if you're looking for a target and you have enough zoom, this could be a great choice. Which is another thing I want to mention about the Ascar. Even though this was only 384 millimeters, because I'm using a one inch sensor, I can really fill the frame with a lot of these smaller nebula. And if I were to really enhance the data, which we can kind of see over here, there's a lot of dust and things which can really add to the photo. Like I said, this still needs a lot of work. This is in a very rough state, but gives you some idea of what I was able to capture. And if we look at our stars again, they don't show any sort of aberrations or distortions besides maybe just some minimal focusing issues on my end. So that's all good there. But we won't know the full extent of any star problems until I'm able to do those tests with my full frame camera later on this year. For these vignette tests, what I did is I took every single configuration, I mounted the telescope on my AM5 and I pointed it directly at my TV with just a blank white screen. Then I put my camera on aperture priority. These were taken with an Nikon D780, so this is the full frame sensor. You get the full effect here. And then what I did is I took a series of photos. And as you look at the raw data, you probably can't see much of a vignette at all, which is a good sign. If I really torture the data though in camera raw, you will start to notice the vignette and a few dust spots here and there. But based on what I'm seeing here, I'm very impressed with the vignette performance. I was expecting a lot worse. And based on what we're seeing, even if you're using a full frame camera and you don't take flats, I think you're gonna be in good shape because the vignette is so minimal. And oddly enough, the worst performing adapter was the reducer. I thought that would have been better, but you know, I would have thought the extender would have the worst vignette, but that's just how it goes with this one. For me personally, I'm not gonna be using a full frame camera with this telescope, so the vignette performance really doesn't concern me because it's automatically gonna be cropped out with my smaller sensor. So that's a good sign. Uh, regardless of the sensor size you're using, vignette won't be much of a concern. And of course, if you take flats, it won't be a problem whatsoever. Next, let's talk about the price of the Ascar V. It currently retails for about $1,700. And while that is pretty steep, if we compare that to the Red Cat 71, it is also $1,700. But with the Red Cat, you're stuck at 360 millimeters. That's all you're getting for that price. Whereas with the Ascar, you're getting, again, pretty much six telescopes for one price. And that's why, for me personally, I think it's a good investment. Because now, I'm gonna be set for five or maybe even 10 years or more with this system. I mean, really, I bought the Red Cat 51 back in 2019, I think. That was about eight or 900 bucks, and it's been lasting me for the last four years. But if I'm getting a system that can go from 270 all the way to 600, I don't see any reason to buy another telescope for the foreseeable future. So in that way, you know, maybe you don't have a telescope yet. You buy this, you're done for five or 10 years. Or maybe you bought a red cat like myself and you want something a bit bigger and better. Well, there you go. The only reason you might not want to get this is just if you want more light you know, something like a Raz or something along those lines where you're getting F2, F2.8, F4, whatever. This is gonna be between, I think, F4 or 5 roughly and F7, depending on the configuration. Either way, I think the average person who has one or two telescopes or maybe no telescopes, this would be a good idea because you really get so many different options, so many different choices for one price. And don't forget, if you are getting the telescope, throw in this 3D printed bat on mass for 20 bucks, that'll go a long way. The final thing we need to talk about today is whether or not I'm actually gonna buy the Ascar V. As I said earlier, Ascar sent this out to me to test and I can either purchase it or send it back. And based on my tests and just thinking things through, I will be purchasing the Ascar V for whatever that's worth. Because the way I'm thinking about this is, I've got the Red Cat, I have been thinking about buying a new telescope, I just didn't know which one. And then the Ascar just magically showed up. And after using it, I really think I can use the system for at least five or 10 years. And for 1700 bucks, I think that's a good investment. The best part is it's lightweight, it's portable, it's easy enough that even I can use it. 
as some of you have probably figured out, I'm not the best at getting all this stuff to work together. So with all that said, I think this is gonna be the perfect solution for myself. And if you're in a similar position, you might wanna look into the Ascar V, invest that money, and then not have to worry about your telescope for many years to come. And that's all I've got for you in today's video. Looking ahead, I will be doing quite a bit more with the Ascar V. So if you wanna see more about the star performance and some new images, stay tuned. And of course, I'll have those in a future update. That's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in another video.